I'd like to welcome you all to this joint EBA and SIDA seminar on the theme Left Behind, Anti-Discrimination in the Fight Against Poverty. Uh, we'll talk about poverty, some of the latest findings in what works in poverty reduction, and we'll talk about how anti-discrimination work best can contribute in this. EBA, the expert group for aid studies, is an independent committee under the Swedish Foreign Ministry charged with analyzing and evaluating Swedish development assistance. Uh, we publish reports and we organize seminars. We also run the EBA podcast. Uh, when publishing reports, we work with what we call a double independence, uh, meaning that uh, when we commission studies, the authors of those reports are are independently responsible for the content of reports, and the EBA puts its uh, quality stamp on it by agreeing to publish. And the EBA, in its turn, it's independent from, from the ministry in, in decisions what to study. My name is Mats Horsmar. I'm working at, in the secretariat of the EBA, and I'll try to moderate today's session. Besides launching a new EBA report, look like this, and I guess you've taken a, your copy already. Uh, we also have the great privilege to launch in Sweden the fourth chronic poverty report. Uh, this report is written and published by the Chronic Poverty Analysis Network, CPAN, headed by Dr. Andrew she Shepard. Uh, Andrew is standing here, by chance. Uh, with the fourth, fourth uh, with the four reports that you've published, you keep the focus on the poorest people and you provide new insights into how most effectively we reduce poverty. In this particular report, you tell us new things about how economic growth best can contribute to poverty reduction. We'll have two presentations each after uh, uh, each other and then followed by a panel discussion up here. Questions can be put towards the end of the seminar, so keep them with you. But now, first, I'd like to introduce Andrew Shepper, who is a principal research fellow at ODI, Overseas Development Institute in London, and also director of the Chronic Poverty Analysis Network. Please, Andrew, the report on chronic poverty. Tell us what, what's in it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to be here, um, both for myself and for Rachel, who will come after me. Uh, I think Matt's has got the challenge of somehow bringing these two topics together, growth and anti-discrimination measures, which um, will be very interesting to hear all your perspectives on that. Hopefully, we'll get to that. Um, the, I don't know if you can see the small print on the, the screen. Maybe not. Should I be a bit closer? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, that gives you some idea of the scope of the current report that we've uh, just published. Um, and uh, I will just say that anti-discrimination measures do feature in this. Uh, the labor market, anti-discrimination measures in the labor market could be a very important part of, if you like, the enabling environment for achieving uh, poverty reduction and certainly for leaving no one behind in that process. Um, but of course, there are many other enabling factors which I probably won't have time to go into today. For example, human development services and macroeconomic policy and so on. I mean, there are many things in here which I will not uh, have much of a chance to um, to talk about. Um, so I want to think about growth. Wait a minute. Oh yes, I'm just getting used to the screen here. That's the next one. Thank you. Um, so we know that, uh, I mean, there's lots of evidence out there, and I think it's one of the working assumptions that many people uh, working in development uh, go around with, that growth helps to reduce poverty. Some people are more affirmative about this. Other people are a bit more critical, so there are different perspectives on it. However, there's less evidence about how this happens and about the variation in time and space 
uh, uh, that it happens. I mean, there is a variation across time and space. So sometimes growth is reducing poverty very effectively. Maybe a little bit later it will be reducing it less effectively. There can, growth is not always poverty reducing. There can be periods of time in certain places where we seem to be going backwards, where there is growth, but poverty is not being reduced. So, for example, uh, recently in Uganda, um, that seems to have been the situation that poverty has actually increased, as measured by the national statistics. In Rwanda, one of the uh, very examples of, of very rapid poverty reduction in the 2000s, in the 2010, in the 2010 decade, uh, this has slowed down to close to zero, again, according to the official statistics. And growth, you know, it, it depends on the sector. Um, we know that if a country is very focused on mineral extraction, this may be less good for making that translation between growth and poverty, uh, poverty reduction, for example. So um, sometimes you can see the results of this in quite graphic form. And we talk about uh, pro-poorest or pro-poor growth. Uh, pro-poor growth we have been talking about for a long time. We have introduced the notion of pro-poorest growth uh, and, of course, anti-poorest growth. And here in these graphs, you can see a couple of distributions. So the poor uh, at the left-hand side of the, uh, of the graph may benefit uh, more or less or the same as other people in the distribution. Uh, so the, the, the relative benefits from growth um, can be quite varied. And there are well-acknowledged influencing factors on these outcomes. Um, so, for example, the rate of growth is very important. Generally speaking, a higher rate of growth is likely to be more effective at reducing poverty. Uh, the sectors we've just discussed, just mentioned the mineral uh, sector, but if you have a process of economic transformation, which is creating jobs, and particularly creating uh, unskilled jobs in manufacturing or in construction, uh, which are accessible to poor people, these are more likely to uh, reduce poverty. Um, then, you know, it depends also what the government is doing, how taxes are collected, the incidence of taxation, uh, and then uh, who is benefiting from public expenditure. So these are all, I think, well-known and well-discussed variables. The link between the formal and, and informal sectors is another thing which is much less discussed, uh, but is also uh, mentioned here and there. I think the formal sector is usually seen as the driver of growth. Uh, so then, you know, the question is, what can the, uh, in that perspective, what can the informal sector, where many poor people are working, uh, what can they pick up from the formal sector? So uh, we, our kind of bread and butter work is examining what we call poverty dynamics. So people escaping poverty, people falling into poverty, people making sustained escapes out of poverty. So now we have more data uh, which tells us what is happening to households in more countries, what is happening to households at three points in time or more. And then you can say, is somebody who has escaped poverty staying out or falling back in on the third time? And then what about the fourth time and so on? So we begin to be able to get, build up a picture of socioeconomic mobility. We would expect that growth, and, and this, this graph just shows you the situation in different countries, so that, um, uh, for example, let me pick out, let me pick out uh, one of the groups here. You have in red, you have people who are making a transitory escape from poverty. So that means they are poor at the first time you do a survey, they escape poverty, they cross the poverty line. These are usually monetary poverty lines uh, at the second time. But at the third time, they are back uh, under the poverty line again. So that would be a transitory escape. 
as compared to a sustained escape where you, you are escaping the second two periods, you're escaping. We don't know what's going to happen beyond that, perhaps. Um, so our study, we would expect that where you have got a consistent pattern of growth, at least, and with some of the conducive factors that I mentioned earlier, that people would be making sustained escapes out of poverty. We don't just want people to cross the poverty line and then hover around there. We want, to, we want them to cross the poverty line, to keep on going, to be really motoring, you might say. And that's what we would hope from growth. But what we see is that, uh, from many of our studies, that the proportion of people escaping and then falling back in is quite high. There is also, of course it varies a lot across countries, some, in some cases very low, Vietnam for example, but in many of the countries up there it's, it's much higher than would be desirable. Um, we also see people who are not poor becoming poor and you know, that's also quite often a surprisingly high fraction uh, of the, the population. Um, and there are many reasons for these poverty dynamics, uh, many reasons, and they vary from one place to another. Um, there are some common factors. I mean, it's, for example, I'm not going to go into all the reasons here, but uh, we can talk about it later if, if people are interested. But, for example, if you look at types of households, it is more difficult for certain types of households to escape poverty uh, and to carry on uh, with upward mobility. So, for example, women-headed households, households with persons with disabilities. It won't be a surprise to you to find that sometimes those type of households tend to be stuck in poverty. Um, and that tells us something about the things which need to be done to release the constraints which, which they face. Um, just a little bit more on this. Uh, this graph shows the ratios between... The, the light green bar shows the ratios between the temporary and sustained escapes. And the dark green bar shows the ratio between what you might call the negative trajectory, so the temporary escapes plus the impoverishment, and the sustained escapes. And where the ratios... Uh, are greater than one, poverty reduction is going to be quite constrained. So you'll see there that there's, there's situations in which those ratios are really much higher than, than uh, is desirable. Uh, what we would expect, what we would hope, I think, is that growth is bringing more opportunities uh, People have more uh, options in terms of creating livelihoods, which will take them out of poverty. That this enables them over a period of time to accumulate assets. And assets are very important in terms of preventing downward mobility. The difference between having, let's say, in many East African, West African economies, having some livestock and not having livestock is huge in terms of the protective effect of uh, the ownership of that asset. Just as an example, but I mean, there are many other examples. Um, so uh, people need to be able to accumulate. Uh, they need to sustain that upward path. Uh, there are many, what we've called here loosely, conversion factors. So you can have an income, you can gain some assets, but if you want to be on that sustained upward path, you probably also need some other things, some personal attributes, uh, some attitudes. You need an enabling environment, social norms which allow you to uh, invest, save, make progress, and so on. Um, and also an absence of discrimination, which may hold, otherwise hold you back. So I'm just going to uh, show you something about John, who is Kenyan. We do a lot of life history work, uh, a lot of qualitative research, which combines uh, life history interviews with focus group discussions, 
and key informant interviews as well. Uh, and we find that this is very helpful in terms of explaining what the quantitative data uh, tells us, going a little bit more deeply into what the quantitative data tells us. And it also gives us nice illustrations like this one. So uh, John dropped out of school. He migrated. He acquired skills and experience. Uh, and eventually he returned home to his rural uh, village. Um, he uh, invested there in land and in businesses. Uh, he's educated his children, some of them privately. But along the way, he's left a girlfriend in Nairobi, uh, and we don't actually know what happens to her as part of this story. So, and, and we often find that escapes from poverty are also somehow matched and qualified by others who don't do so well. And the relational aspects of uh, getting out of poverty can be extremely important. And in fact, this is leading us to begin to change our research method, which is quite a big thing for a researcher, <laughs> maybe a small thing for you, um, to capture a little bit better some of these relational aspects. So, you know, we would, in this case, try and go and interview the girlfriend. We feel that's... Anyway, that's something for the future that we'll do. Um, so what do we find when we look into the type of growth which is really conducive for escaping poverty and particularly for making a sustained escape? And this, in a sense, is the, this is the meat of the, um, the presentation. Um, we distinguish between what we've called growth from above and growth from below. Um, growth from above being uh, large, the large formal investments that many governments would like to encourage. And many governments would see this as being what promotes, uh, what best promotes growth and poverty reduction. <laughs> growth from below, small informal investments uh, in agriculture, in the informal sector, in the rural non-farm economy, um, often involving migration and so on. So uh, what we argue is that both of these can be very important in terms of reducing poverty. And what is needed is some kind of a balance, in terms of policy, some kind of a balance between the two. What we think is the case, but we'll come back to this later, is that a lot of governments favour growth from above and either disfavour or are neutral about growth from below. Don't do very much to promote it. Growth from above uh, has potential to uh, reduce poverty through labor-intensive manufacturing with migration opportunities, for example, in Cambodia, the garments industry, Bangladesh, the garments industry, where people have migrated from upcountry, often very poor people, often women, uh, with limited education, and they've been able to get jobs. I mean, those jobs are not always perfect. Five minutes left. Thank you very much. I will speed up. Um, uh, we've talked about uh, minerals, mineral development not being very conducive to uh, poverty-reducing growth. Um, but there are cases, Mongolia is a case in point, where uh, a government develops a sovereign wealth fund, which invests, for example, in human development with enormous positive impact. Linking the formal and informal sector is another way in which um, growth from above can trickle down effectively through contracting, through outworking, uh, and other, other mechanisms. But um, those linkages are often not very strong. So then growth from below, um, I mean, this is composed of many things. We've just mentioned the informal sector. The informal sector is often very constrained by regulations and um, a, a relatively hostile institutional environment. So removing these constraints, constraints is about being very selective in terms of the regulations and the taxes which impinge on these small informal firms. What we found uh, looking at uh, the rural non-farm economy in particular is that very few countries have positive policies towards the rural non-farm economy. Often they have quite positive policies towards smallholder agricultures, agriculture, but this is not extended to the, um, 
to the rural non-farm economy. Building assets, and there are so many uh, development interventions which attempt to build assets. This is a very important uh, part of growth from below and can be very helpful. Interventions can be very helpful. Empowering uh, the poorest women, also very important. Uh, women can be empowered over the long term by equalizing rights to land and other property, but this is often a highly contested measure politically, very difficult to, to implement. And so we often find that interventions focus on uh, other more feasible measures, for example, through financial inclusion or creating a financial services ladder from the uh, savings and credit groups that women often participate in to uh, slightly higher forms of uh, financial service. Um, and this can then be integrated with uh, um, support to wider support to business development. So I'm under time pressure. I did want to focus a little bit on, I'm going to leave the uh, wage labor market tightening issue, which um, is interesting, but I want to focus a little bit on what uh, is being done in terms of supporting growth from above and growth from below. And first, in a, this is a sample of um, developing countries that, where we've done some analysis of what you might call pro-poor growth policies. We actually need to go and revise this a little bit in the light of this analysis of growth from above and growth from below. But you can see, if you look at the scores on the right-hand side of this table, um, the top score is, is either, I think, 6.5 or 7, depending on the country. And there's a big variety of scores. So some countries have good sets of policies aimed to support <laughs> pro-poor growth. Other countries have much less good policies. And we try to include in this a measure uh, of the extent to which the policy is implemented. Coming to the donors, uh, do they... Um, one minute left, yes, okay, I'm nearly at the end. Do they uh, support growth from above or growth from below? Our hypothesis was that donors, like governments, would typically be more interested in growth from above. But what we found, uh, using the OECD uh, DAC statistics and, you know, our own categorization of what uh, elements of donor interventions support growth from above and growth from below, we actually found a fairly balanced picture. A lot of that is accounted for by uh, the support to agriculture. But that was quite uh, an interesting finding. And then I think this is the last slide. Um, this shows uh, the support to growth from below and growth from above. And then there's support uh, which goes to both, if you like, both growth from below, from diff for different donors. And I don't know if you can see it there, but Sweden is there. It's uh, about one, two, three, four, five, six from the bottom. Um, and can you see how balanced it is? Does it look balanced? Or not? So growth from below is blue. Growth from uh, sorry, growth from above is blue, growth from below is orange, and both is kind of pale blue. And then other, other aid, you know, aid for human development and emergencies and so on is the other, the black one. Does Sweden look balanced or not? A little more from above. It's not bad, though. It's not bad. Yeah. Not quite as good as USAID. Anyway, ending on that competitive note... <laughs> Thank, leave the rest of it to thank you so much, Andrew. Um, there is uh, a positive message I found in, the, in the, your report uh, that most people living in poverty do it from, uh, through the growth from below, that is uh, through their own efforts, isn't it? Um, rather than strategies from above, but that pre pre preconditions must be right then for this to happen. In the chronic poverty uh, you, you could uh, either sit here or there. Uh, in the chronic poverty report, there's a chapter on how to enable uh, economic growth to reduce poverty faster and do it more effectively. You deal with infrastructure in that. You deal with human development, education and skills, social protection. Uh, things that has to do with connecting and involving people. Uh, 
uh, these are to, to make the poor benefit from, from growth. Uh, these are things that CEDA and the Swedish Development Corporation work a lot with. Um, but then there's a fifth area as well in that chapter, uh, where, where also the Swedish Development Corporation is involved and does a lot of work. But that's not seen as poverty reduction so often. Uh, it's uh, anti-discrimination. And uh, when realizing that anti-discrimination is somehow forgotten in this particular setting, the CPAN and the EBA some time back looked deep, decided to look deeper into it. Uh, and I'd like to in introduce Rachel Marcus, has done uh, now a second report for, for the EBA. The first one came uh, two years back on, on anti-discrimination and what government uh, governments can do. Now it's a the impact of civil society in anti-discrimination initiatives, rapid review. Uh, the title says what it's all about. So, please, Rachel, what is in this report? Thank you, Mats, and um, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So... As Matt said, um, this, what I'm presenting is the second of the reports that we've done on um, anti-discrimination measures. The first one, two years back, focused on large-scale government-led efforts, particularly around legal reform and uh, big programs, affirmative action measures, and so on. And at the time, it was very apparent that the role of civil society and civil society actions to counter discrimination were the missing other half of that whole area of work. And so that's why we decided to follow up with the second report, um, which was intended to be a, a smaller piece of work, but it grew and grew. And you'll see when I present that there, there is an enormous variety of interesting initiatives that are going on in this space. Um, and so what I'm going to present is aiming to make some sense of, of those and, and talk about what leads to success or, and, and what we know because there are a lot of um, knowledge gaps in this area too. So this diagram is the, the theory of change that we've been working with to, to try to think through how could work to combat discrimination have an impact on poverty and we've been working with the the very helpful framework that CEDA's developed for understanding different elements of poverty, um, access to resources, opportunity and voice power and human security and discrimination impinges on all of those and so anti-discrimination measures have a, a possibility to change any of those dimensions. Um, we also outline some of the enabling factors and I won't be able to talk so much about the impact of the measures we looked at um, and their interaction with the enabling factors because very few of the studies actually commented on those. It was a real and clear lack um, that the very few studies reflected on that context. But to, to move through first what we, what we did learn rather than what we couldn't learn, these are the three main types of strategies that we identified. And um, of these, a significant majority of the evidence was around changing discriminatory norms. A lot of it, the majority again of that, probably two thirds, was community level um, initiatives um, or mass media campaigns that were aiming to reach the general public and change norms um, on gender, on um, to change, combat discrimination against people with HIV, to challenge racism, for example. And then a smaller proportion of those were aiming to change norms among service providers so that, you know, for example, teachers would, um, you know, not, would, would stop discriminatory behavior before, before they did it. So rather than automatically discriminating against a child because they were from a poor or low caste or minority ethnic group, that they would check themselves and not, not enact those prejudices and treat all children equally or the same with, service, with the health service providers. So, um, a quick overview then of the studies we, we looked at. Um, in total, 103 um, quite geographically clustered, I'll show on the next slide. Um, quite a range of areas of discrimination. 
Um, there were some which we had also intended to look at, but found very little on, for example, discrimination on grounds of age or um, stigma against people with mental ill health. Um, so that's why we have the representation that we do here. And as you'll see, um, over half the literature was grey literature, so it came from NGOs' own reports. They were, in, they were in some way rigorous, so they had involved some external evaluator as well, but they were often in partnership with the implementing organisation. Um, some academic studies, um, relatively few, very few randomised control trials or any of the methodologies that are increasingly seen as rigorous, but really because of the nature of the the areas of work that, for example, advocacy campaigns or pieces of uh, litigation don't lend themselves to that kind of analysis. Much more of the what's sort of thought of as more rigorous evaluation came of the community level campaigns, which could be set up as an initiative, the impacts monitored and the effects assessed. So this slide just shows the, um, the distribution really of the initiatives we looked at, the colours don't mean anything, they're just different coloured pins for each country, so that to try to distinguish them a bit. Um, you can see that there's a big clustering in Africa, um, um, but as I mentioned on the previous slide, overall the largest single number of studies was in India. So I'll talk through the three, the findings and the three different strategies. Um, within the grouping on changing discriminatory norms, these were the main types of strategies that we saw. Um, it was really striking the wide range of activities that, and you know, the energy and the the innovativeness in the different initiatives that um, that we reviewed. Um, you know, from. <laughs> Things like um, working with journalists to try to encourage them to to write more um, friendly stories about uh, people with HIV, for example, or to um, promote a more positive view of women in politics that was part of a broader process then of trying to encourage greater uh, women's political uh, participation and, and was successful in, in contributing to a rise in the number of people, number of women represented in political institutions that was in, in Lebanon. You know, there were um, theatre for change, um, both relatively large-scale projects crossing a number of countries and then very small-scale micro-initiatives that individual schools, teachers, um, health services had come up with to try to, to lead to change. Um, there were initiatives bringing young people together from different majority and minority communities um, to promote refugee integration um, or to bring people from religious groups who were often in conflict together to do a neutral activity. In one case, it was sports. In another case, it was learning computing skills. But they were that integration was being promoted in the con without necessarily being overt about it, but bringing young people together to to dispel prejudices against the other group. Um, so what did we learn from this, this really quite large variety? Um, one thing was that when people from marginalised groups were able to, to speak out and give personal testimonies about their experience, or when, when people were, able, were encouraged to be empathetic in some way to understand what the experience of discrimination was actually like, um, that led, led to quite a large shift in the way that the, the people from the, the group doing the discrimination, the advantaged group, thought about the issues. Um, of course, very few of these studies were then able to follow through over a period of time to see if their behaviour changed, but, um, but at least there was that initial shift in attitudes. Um, it was also clear, though, that it was risky, or could be risky, for... Um, the people from the discriminated against groups to stand up and say, you know, I am a person with HIV or I am gay and, you know, but yes, I am, I am a human being and, you know, our political discourse is saying I am, I am a demon, I'm terrible, but actually I'm a human being and I have all these the same wishes and, and desires as you. Um, so it, was, it could be very powerful, but it could also be very risky and so um, something that has to be, be thought about very carefully in context. Um, a lot of these 
approaches were very focused on personal behaviour change. On, a one, on the one hand, personal behaviour change is essential. You know, discrimination doesn't end unless individuals stop doing it and they, they check themselves and they interact with everybody in an equal and respectful way. Um, on the other hand, that's often where they stopped and really, relatively few of these initiatives were able to take the next step up to to enable that to have a, a wider effect to change society through any other route than just individual interactions. Um, and that reflects the fact that many of them were so small, they were funded for a short period of time, uh, they were often experimental. Um, but one thing I'll come back to in this presentation is, is how there didn't seem to be much... You know, sist or a big gap seems to be how to get a bigger impact um, how, how to sustain this on a much larger scale. Um, because discriminatory social norms are very embedded and they are passed on from generation to generation, um, they are passed on when new, new teachers or health workers or police join, their, join the service that they're working in, there's a need for these approaches to be repeated over time again and again. So there needs to be refreshers with new cohorts, say, of police coming in. Um, you know, you can... It's all very well to run a, a radio drama series over a year or two and, say, to promote more positive gender norms. And at the time, you, know, you can do a survey that shows that things have changed and people have more, more egalitarian views. But we know that gender norms are entrenched, they, um, they often persist for a very long period of time. And that as a new cohort come up who, is, uh, who also are socialised into inegalitarian ways and practices, um, a two-year radio drama is only going to have little, uh, it's not going to be affecting them. So there's a need for these constantly to be repeated. Um, linking to some points we'll make later also, um, It, it was really clear in some of the examples that even when um, there was, for example, a well-designed training course to um, get health workers to treat all their clients in an equal manner, at the same time, there were, were other legal factors that were stopping them from actually being able to do that. For, so, for example, um, one of the training courses in India, at, at the same time as the health workers were being encouraged to um, not discriminate against anyone who came to the service, at the same time, they also required to check the ID of the person accessing the service. Now, people from the poorest, more marginalised groups, the, the lowest class and so on, often didn't have those IDs because they hadn't been able to afford to spend the time to go and get that ID. Um, it cost them time, it cost them money, it cost them an experience of being discriminated against and facing rudeness and, and a bureaucracy that made it difficult for even to get them get those IDs in the first place. So then you know they were still unable to access those services. Um, a point that also came up quite a lot in relation to the to discrimination in service provision was the, the need for additional resourcing to um, so for example there's been a lot of training of teachers in um, non-discriminatory practice and inclusion of children with different kinds of disabilities but often that's not really resourced so it stays at the level of teachers having gone undergone a training course and this is the policy but very little actual inclusion. The second strategy we looked at um, we broadly classified as empowerment of discriminated against and groups so that there's a crossover between all of these strategies, but this one was intending to build up the skills and the resources of members of, of discriminated against groups so that they could advocate on their own behalf, um, so that they could represent themselves, so that they could seek justice. Um, a few of these interventions then also went wider and worked with members, with other stakeholders or members of discriminating communities to change their norms, but that wasn't the emphasis except in a few of them. And again, there was quite a, a range of approaches. Um, some of the, I would say, the, the ones that were showing the strongest um, evidence of change were the multi-stakeholder approaches uh, working with police, um, health workers, um, 
with taxi drivers, um, with public media campaigns, and also at the same time including legal knowledge and empowerment um, for, for women sex workers so that they knew their rights, so they knew... Um, what they could do if they were attacked by a client, um, what their rights were in terms of accessing healthcare, um, what their rights were in terms of their broader citizenship rights to be able to access rations and so on. Um, those were also interesting and impressive examples because they built on a range of other experiences of similar activities that had been led by civil society in India. And it seemed that there was some active learning of things, of similar initiatives in different states. Um, and also, this was one of the few examples we found where uh, a quite complex civil society initiative then evolved into a government partnership and was taken on afterwards. Um, but we can also see that, you know, again, they range. There's some, you know, innovative use of technology, for example. There's quite a bit around representation and mobilization to um, both, you know, struggle together to for, for rights, but also to provide peer support within the community of people who are facing discrimination. Um, some innovative examples of of trying to support groups to be in a public space in some way um, as a provider of a service, whether that's a, a restaurant or a taxi service or um, in a position in a public service so that, again, that they are they're personally empowered. They're also something of a figurehead for their community and also it's starting to shift norms. And so there's a, there's a, you know, a linkage between all of these strategies. Um, I mentioned a bit that, that some of those India examples were among the most most impressive. On the whole, the, the smaller scale initiatives tended to be quite time bound. Um, the, the, the initiatives promoting representation were encouraging, but but mostly in terms of people's own sense of empowerment and their own ability to fight discrimination, there was less real evidence of change as a result of those in terms of decision making, you know, on local government committees um, or the other institutions where people were represented. The third group of uh, strategies we looked at were around advocacy for legal and policy change, um, both public campaigns and strategic litigation to um, bring a court case on behalf of a discriminated against group and um, try to either remove a discriminatory regulation or to get a law implemented or, or very often in, in these cases secure their access to land or access to medicines. Those seem to be two of the most um, common areas that we found um, strategic litigation in. So I've had a warning of five minutes. I won't go into detail on the examples, but as with all the other areas, there was quite a range. Um, I'll move straight to the, the lessons and challenges. Um, what was very striking with these examples in particular was the disconnect between, on the one hand, the often a, a positive process of um, energizing and empowering people who took part in the preparation of a case and you know their own learning and their ability to speak out in public and on the other hand and quite often then after some time not always the first time getting to a positive judgment um, you know using using the law because of course many states or most states have um, formally have anti-discrimination laws and so often the judgments would be in favor but then a complete lack or a very serious delay in implementation uh, because it went against the interests of a more powerful party. Um, a, a point that also really emerged was the importance of working with the judiciary to uh, sensitise and educate them into, into, the, into the reasons why this was an important case, into the kinds of discrimination the different groups face and why um, the challenge was being set up as it was. Because often members of the judiciary are representatives of the elite. They have generally had an advantage pathway through life and are very often not aware of the impacts of discrimination. Interestingly, this was one of the areas of analysis where we found some direct evidence around the linkage to poverty reduction. And um, there was a World Bank study that compared a number of different 
um, strategic litigation cases and found that the most pro-poor ones were tended to be the ones that were that were around regulation in some way, removal of constraining regulations or um, promoting more positive ones. And the ones that were strategic litigation to get resources spent on an individual, as you could guess, were generally the, the least pro-poor. But there have been a number of those where people have said, you know, seen in the law, there is a right to healthcare or there's a right to education and then have gone to court to try to get resources spent on them to do that. Um, the other major challenge that's worth noting with this is around the shrinking space for civil society. Um, not all of these cases, but the vast majority had been in um, contexts of democracy and um, in places where there was a relatively vibrant civil society. Um, with space closing down in many contexts, people were certainly continuing to do this, but it was becoming more challenging. Uh, my next slide... Um, summarizes what have been the impacts on anti on the different dimensions of poverty. Well, we found very little on resources other than nominally securing land rights. Um, as I mentioned before, quite a bit on um, use of, well, on the experience of using services, but the studies didn't tend to feed through to then say whether this improved the quality, whether it really improved the usage or not, but we did get evidence that there was at least some reduction in discriminatory actions. Um, on power and voice, I mentioned earlier that there was a good amount of evidence, or at least many initiatives, but um, it tended to be clustered around the empowerment impacts and not so much on feeding through to challenging discrimination more generally, which is something we also found uh, to an extent in the um, report we did two years ago. And on the human security, again, it's a very under-discussed dimension other than a few initiatives around gender-based violence. Um, but potentially, because an anti-discrimination approach, you know, Increase, improves people's everyday interactions, you know, reduces the amount of hostility they will face, and so on. At the micro level, I think that there's a lot of potential. Um, I am rapidly running out of time. So um, to pick out a few of, of the most important findings um, that I haven't already said, most of the initiatives we looked at looked at one form of discrimination. Apart from the, the example of the women sex workers in India who were discriminated against on grounds of gender, um, their occupation, their, that they were often HIV positive, and also often their caste status, um, most of the initiatives focused on one group. Um, it would seem like there's quite a lot of potential for a stronger, more holistic approach that's perhaps more focused on securing everybody's rights um, perhaps using human rights language where that um, doesn't, you know, immediately cause a backlash. Um, but there's no real evaluation of that. So we think that could be an interesting direction for future work. There are a lot of knowledge gaps. Um, the next slide summarizes them. Um, I think, you know, they're, they're on the whole quite self-explanatory. Um, you know, they're all areas where we found either very few studies or or that studies didn't move up a perspective at all and didn't bring bring their thoughts together. Um, I also would just also like to throw out there as, as a final thing that looking at, at this whole set of initiatives does raise some quite important, difficult and challenging questions for donors as to how one can best support um, civil society action of this kind um, without overstepping the bounds of what somebody from outside Canada should be doing. Thank you so much, Rachel, for this. Uh, I'd now like uh, the panel to join me up here. Uh, we have a panel uh, with the authors, uh, Rachel and Andrew, coming on as well. Uh, uh, David Lawson, uh, you're, from, you're a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute, also professor linked to Manchester and uh, Helsinki and Beijing University, and I probably could go on longer. We have uh, Hans Linde, who is uh, chair of the RFSU, a Swedish uh, organization working on sexual and reproductive health and rights. We have Colin Kronlid, who is, uh, since Monday this week, uh, with the chief economist team at SIDA. She, she has been, you have been working with Afghanistan as analysts here at SIDA. Uh, and then we have uh, Andrew somewhere, and uh, can, is, is there... Space for you, or yeah, 
let's use the, the mic. Uh, I, I'd like us to, to think a bit about uh, the linkages between poverty reduction and anti-discrimination. And I'd like to start with you, Hans, uh, Linde. Uh, you, you are chair of the RFSU, uh, clearly an anti-discrimination organization. And you work uh, since many years, uh, the organization works since many years back in Sweden and in other countries. Have you ever thought of this, your work, as being a part of uh, promoting inclusive economic growth or uh, work of poverty reduction? Well, thank you. This it should be possible to put on underneath if it's not... No. Can we have the other now? mic, perhaps? Now it's working. Great. Uh, Mats, thank you for, for the question and thank you for, for inviting uh, me to, to this seminar. First of all, our, our, our mission is to, to promote sexually reproductive health and rights for all with a rights-based approach. That's been our work and our, our mission since 1933 when we were founded. But of course, we have over the years seen a very clear link between the work we are doing and the question about poverty in a number of different areas. Uh, it's quite obvious that if you deny uh, the right to, to dis make decisions over your own body and your own sexuality, it will have consequences uh, for your entire life, for your, your, your freedom, your, your opportunities, for your, your opportunity to, uh, to an access to healthcare, to education, and participation in the labor market, etc. And of course, it will, at the end of the day, also have a consequence for your, your income and your opportunity to, to leave poverty. I can give... Two, two examples from our work. One of our focus area uh, is abortion and abortion, of, abortion rights. And we, of course, see that in countries where you deny women access to safe abortion, it has consequences for their opportunity to have an education, to, have an, uh, to access the labor market, and to have an income of their own. Uh, and also, another aspect of abortion rights when it comes to, to, to poverty is that we can clearly see that uh, limiting access to safe abortion, of course, of consequences for the health of women and girls. And we know that ill health is one of the main reasons why uh, people are kept in poverty or being falling back into poverty again. So here we can see a number of very clear links between abortion rights and poverty. So, so I could uh, kind of breathe now because we put these two reports together in the same seminar. So there are links between them, uh, would you say? And Andrew, uh, you've been thinking about these links for some time. Uh, but when we think of poverty reduction, we think of sort of affirmative action, empower people, enable, lift up. Uh, whereas anti-discrimination just stop uh, treating, stop excluding. So two different ways. Should we perceive of, of anti-discrimination as a precondition for poverty reduction? Well, I think in, in many situations where uh, discrimination is present, and there is most, in most situations there is at least some significant discrimination, and poor people face it very often, um, you know, it would seem very logical that it could be a precondition. Um, I mean, I think if we want... You can do poverty reduction in different ways. You know, you can, you can try to reduce the poverty of those who are less poor, or you can focus on the poorest, or you can try to do both. If you want to focus on the poorest, if you want to leave no one behind, in that slogan that uh, the UN has now adopted, then I think dealing with discrimination in some way and where it's necessary, affirmative action measures, could be a precondition. I'll just reflect on a little bit of experience from, from Rwanda recently, where uh, the Rwandan government is, for, is conscious of many aspects of discrimination, some of which they uh, kind of keep in the background of public discussion. But in terms of gender relationships and promoting gender equality, they have made huge efforts uh, over the last 20 years. Um, and they've done some, some quite interesting things because, as Rachel was saying, you can have good policies, good measures in the book, on the paper, uh, 
but you have to implement them. And mm. obviously, CSOs, in a way, are one channel for doing that. But you really need implementation. You need a commitment to implementation from governments as well. And that is present in the Rwandan government. So, for example, uh, they've had uh, uh, marriage reforms, um, inheritance reforms. Uh, they've tried to promote um, equal rights to land among men and women, mm. among married couples. Uh, and not only have they done this on paper, but they've gone out with their administrations at local level and tried to implement it. So they've, you know, where a couple is separating, maybe a local administrator or a local important person will come along and try to make sure that the husband uh, does not stop paying for the children. Mm. I mean, things like that are really, yeah. really impressive. Mm. Mm. But, but, and there's a big but which we found in our research in Rwanda, approximately one third of uh, unions between men and women are informal. So they're not registered marriages. Mm -hmm. And those people are not protected. They are probably more poor households in that group than other households. Mm -hmm. Also, polygamous, polygamous marriages are excluded from protection. So there's mm -hmm. still quite a, a way to go. And here we touch on something very sensitive in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And I think these issues often bring up you know, huge sensitivities. So the Rwandan government, and I think elite generally, is very committed to people getting married. Mm -hmm. It's kind of written, you know, the protections are written into the constitution and so on if you're mm -hmm. married. If you're not married, and you know, the question we, we were saying to people, could you possibly extend mm. these protections to people who are not formally married? So but the no, form, they can't. The, the formal can't, and formal you know? uh, linkage is important there as well. Absolutely. Corian, uh, you've been working uh, with Afghanistan, but also uh, with the uh, CEDAS uh, multidimensional poverty analysis tool, where you have four uh, areas, uh, four dimensional resources, and, and uh, Rachel showed the image of that uh, just earlier. Um, you have uh, resources, you have human security, opportunity and choice, power and voice, uh, would you say that anti-discrimination is related to one of these or to all of these? How should we see this connection? How do you see it? Is it? It's on. Yes, good. Yes, and I think that's an in, that's an interesting question, and I think the conclusion that you were drawing, Rachel, is I mean that it had anti-discrimination work had different impacts on the different dimensions and I think that depends on what type of discrimination we are talking about and, and what group we are working with. For instance, when we did the multidimensional analysis, multidimensional poverty analysis for Afghanistan, um, I mean, first of all, Afghanistan is a country where almost everyone is poor. In 2013 to 14, poverty was 38%, three years later up to 55 and with the recent uh, changes, the negative ones that we have seen, it's, it's probably even higher, maybe up to two thirds. So you have a country where almost everyone is poor. And also this concept of leave no one behind, I think looking at the people of Afghanistan, you would say there is no development there that could leave anyone behind. So, so everyone is in a way left behind. And, um, but of course, I mean, even in such a context, you need to look further than that. There are groups who are especially poor or especially deprived, and part of that is related to discrimination. Mm. So one of our big conclusions was that the multidimensional poverty of women is much deeper than that of men because they are discriminated against in most aspects of life. Um, so you, you said that, uh, well, basically the half, half of the population are not allowed to leave their homes. And the, you... there are different... I mean, we have... There are some instances of laws which are discriminating oh. against women, but also then norms to a large degree. If you look at the percentage of people who think that women should be able to vote, it's, it's a majority. Mm. But then if you ask, well, should women decide on their own who to vote for? That's approximately half of the population that thinks that. So that's really constraining women's voice, for mm. women's power and voice. Mm. And... Uh, more than half experience partner violence, uh, literacy rates among women is so much lower than among men. So, mm. so 
So of course, working with women's discrimination is a powerful, powerful um, anti-poverty effort when the discrimination is taking place in so many dimensions of their lives. Mm. So I really think it's it's related there. But but again, I mean, it's it's what Rachel said. It depends on what type of discrimination you are addressing. Mm. So, so the question is, how relevant is this linkage between poverty and anti-discrimination in various settings? In various, uh, we need to understand it in, differently in different settings. David, you've been working on, on uh, a lot of work on, on what works for Africa's poorest. Uh, in countries where you've been working, uh, how relevant is anti-discrimination as, as part of poverty? Or uh, discrimination as part of poverty? Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Also, um, I'd like to just make one background point. It's hard to. It's it's um, it's a general point in relation to the first report, uh, which has led on to the second report. It's the fact that it's hard to imagine that 20 years ago we weren't really focusing on the concepts and the measurement of anything other than poverty. So I think the Chronic Poverty Research Centre and CPAN have done a great job with this fourth report. And, and if nothing else, over the last 20 years they've really highlighted this new concepts of chronic poverty, which has led to a bigger debate with respect to discrimination, access to justice. I think for that, I think it's, it's really welcome. So, um, so now to try and answer your question, uh, which is impossible. But, <laughs> <laughs> but let me try. Um, I mean, I think I'd like to make two points to try and answer your, uh, your broad question in terms of the connection between the two. I think the first point is about measurement and perception of what discrimination is and perception of what poverty is. I think we've, we've, we've gone down a, a very... So in Uganda, for example. Uganda, in the 90, early 1990s, the big component was we focus on economic growth and its impact on, on, on poverty. Uganda was the darling of development aid throughout the 1990s. It had significant poverty reduction, down from around 50%, down to around 20 and beyond percent. Chronic poverty fell. But ultimately, we started focusing, we started using national data, household data sets, which are prone to error. They're an intravenous sample. So I'm coming to the answer in a second. So, and if we're taking an intravenous sample, by default, we're not necessarily focusing on the extreme poor. We're not focusing on the homeless, we're not focusing on the disabled, we're not focusing on the person who lives under the bridge. So in terms of measurement of extreme poverty and the linkage with discrimination, for me, I think the future research and the current research has to be identification. So we need to identify who, the, who, would, who are the discriminated and the measurement of the real extreme poor. And all of this basically links into the debate with respect to how we get to zero. So that's my first major point. So um, you mentioned uh, in terms of the connection between the two. I think, I think donors have a huge role to play in this. Um, whether we like it or not, and I, some donors might not appreciate these comments, but donors claim to be aligned to national development plans. But in reality, we are, or donors tend to be aligned to very specific components of national development plans. So, in effect, to tackle inequality, you need to build a framework of people's participation once you understand what the discrimination and the extreme poverty link is. With that, so ultimately making people, agents of economic growth, and agents of their own destiny. And that's where I think the discrimination and the measurement of discrimination, the, just, they, uh, the measurement of extreme poverty, is really important. And that's where we need to move. Hmm. Okay. Long answer that perhaps didn't answer your question. Yeah, but you answered some more sensible questions, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> um, Rachel, in, in, in your report, you find that uh, CSO interventions are often aim to change attitudes and behavior. That's a major thrust of what uh, these organizations do. But uh, it's often small scale and local. Uh, why is that? Is it because... Uh, those interventions are more effective than others. After all, we're trying to change the, the attitudes of people who don't know that they need to change and probably don't want to change. So you need some clear, clo close interaction. Is it the effectiveness argument that, uh, that is there before, be behind this approach? I think well, it's, it's a range of things. So I think the reason that they're small and not scaled up is largely because either an organization has 
come up with an identified a problem, come up with an idea and decided to do something about it, but they don't have a lot of resources. Or even if they're funded by a donor, it's generally still on a relatively small scale. Um, you know, perhaps they they work in you know four or five districts as, as opposed to one, or maybe they go to several provinces. But but the coverage is is patchy, and I think it's it's all about resourcing. But I think your question about actually maybe that's in some way maybe it is very important that those are locally driven and it is is important because we do get very obsessed sometimes in the development community about scaling up and large impacts and that on the one hand is absolutely right because you don't change things systemically but i think the point that's embedded there about maybe effective approaches to discrimination do have to be very locally nuanced because they're, they're responding to the way that discrimination plays out in particular contexts and circumstances, um, I think it is a very important one. And the way, you know, it's configured. So, so I mean, I talked very positively about the, the India examples working with, with women who were facing a range of discriminations. Um, and, and partly because they responded to that whole cluster of discrimination that, that that they faced, but clearly, I mean that that approach maybe has some lessons, but you know it's not transplantable, not necessarily scalable in, into a different context. Mm. So Hans, uh, your organisation, uh, when you work with your partners, uh, do you go local as such? But you, you you also do some media campaigning, sort of the natural scale, and it works in some areas but not in others. What, what's your perspective on this where we have made a decision that that we only support partners and help them in their capacity building in their political advocacy because we see that working uh, with sexual reproductive rights in most of the times really complex uh, settings you know we don't really as a swedish organization, organization have that mandate uh, to be the ones you know making the difference so we try to support our partners in in their work uh, and they we can clearly see that um, uh, when we support our partners we're working with more than 40 partners in in four different continents we can see that there's a great need to understand also the local setting because uh, there's not really one size fits all here. You really need to understand the, the local setting, the local context, and adapt your, your, your strategies mm -hmm. from that. Um, but at the same time, we can see, and you know, at a time where we see that the, the space for civil society is shrinking, I think especially for organizations working with issues like ours, the more, more controversial issues, it's so important that you share experiences. Uh, so I, I key uh, part of our strategy has been to connect civil society organizations with each other on the national level, but also you know, you know, between organizations working in different regions or even in different continents, because there's a lot of lessons being learned from, from, from between these organizations. So, so I, I gather that you recommend that as well, Rachel, to, to sort of work more uh, in coalition with others, uh, larger coalitions. and. Is this uh, because of a pressure uh, to respond to the uh, shrinking space, or is it, has it other advantages as well? As well. Well, I think certainly, you know, in the context of a shrinking space, then organisations will be stronger in partnership than than on their own. I think also because it can bring in ideas and approaches that have been maybe tried to combat one kind of discrimination but you know they could also be useful in, in another context and perhaps bring a different lens and, and a way of seeing things mm. so that that's why we highlighted that as as an, an idea that we felt needed you know more more emphasis um perhaps more more support and um and was likely to be effective. And certainly, you know, the, at the more political end of what we looked at, the advocacy campaigns, the legal campaigns, and so on, mm. generally they, they brought in a range of actors um, and, and they were coalitions of, of different types of organisations sometimes. Sometimes NGOs, sometimes trade unions, sometimes kind of local associations or indigenous rights associations. And it, I think, it, they, you know, because they crossed quite a lot of constituencies, that also helped them to to build support well, if we look at the uh, some other situations afghanistan or uganda uh, what's the scope of working uh, with coalitions there is there a scope for so no okay i couldn't say anything about that that's why i was okay <laughs> yes. yeah so i'm happy to so, hear about uganda instead uh, 
I mean, these are very difficult settings. I understand also the Uganda setting is, is difficult nowadays. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, um, coalitions at what level? I mean, coalitions at the very local. Uh, so, in, so let me give you the story. Andrew gave a very pertinent and clear example of what's happened in Rwanda. Mm. And, 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 and his view is, is perceived to be a good example in terms of the, the, the process of engendering policy. Or I, I don't know whether he said those words, but that's the interpretation I got. With Uganda, uh, Uganda was the, the lead of this. And so in the early 1990s, I, was part, I worked for a number of NGOs in the southwest corner of Uganda, Rakai. Were, it was the epicenter of HIV AIDS, slim. So... It was in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s. There was an awful lot of collaboration between local NGOs, even local councils for plays, national theatres, and we saw all this 25, 30 years ago. But as is the, 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 the cycles of, of, of donor appeasement and donor desire, as well as government desire and local government and, 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 and actors and their incentives, changes throughout the time periods. So what we've seen in the case of Uganda is a very positive engendering process, complemented in the early 2000s with the World Bank and the big multilateral donors coming in and, and really pushing this agenda, wanted to analyse gender from a household poverty perspective. But then in the last three or four years, well, the last 15 years, this has really fallen off the, 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 the priority list completely. To the point that I was in Morocco, 52nd in March, as on a panel uh, looking at the uh, expert panel looking at gender budgeting. And now many of those, or several East African countries, including Uganda, don't really push the collaboration and some of the actions that would actually remove discrimination at the local level. They hide behind macro indicators. So we have done this gender budgeting law, we have done this gender equality law, and it's now become a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. So within this process of collaboration, it, it goes through cycles, depending upon what the de desires and the agenda is of the, the particular donor, particular country, the particular national, local government actors. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so in, in such a tricky situation where, where you're squeezed, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to work. Hans, we, we talked uh, earlier about uh, Bangladesh case. Bangladesh is also moving, unfortunately, in an authoritarian uh, direction, but you've been, your partners there have been doing some interesting work still. I'm thinking about the UPR. Yes. Um, that, that's we. We are supporting a number of partners in, 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 in Bangladesh, for example, working with LGBTQI issues in an extremely difficult setting, in a setting that's becoming more and more difficult for every day, uh, to be honest. Uh, what we have been supporting them to do is to, to build these coalitions, and we have seen that they have actually been quite successful. One case, as you mentioned, is how they managed to build coalitions with other civil society organizations when it came to uh, the UPR process. Which UPR, we should explain, uh, Universal periodic, periodic Review, which is the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Commission's peer review process of countries. Mm -hmm. If you've signed uh, uh, Convention uh, for, of Human Rights, mm -hmm. You, you're obliged to follow that. Mm -hmm. And uh, every five years, you get to Geneva to check on this, mm -hmm. how, how you're doing on it. And then the civil society can yes. come in and contribute. And, and, and in this case, our partner working with LGBTQI issues, which are so controversial uh, in, in Bangladesh, they managed through coalition building to get a number of recommendations in the UPR process connecting to sexual rights, for example, uh, or um, both sexual orientation and gender identity, which for them were an enormous success to actually get that into, you know, into the process. I think in Bangladesh we've also seen cases of, you know, importance of building coalitions, for example, with, with also with donors and uh, foreign missions, uh, where, you know, that's been a central part of ensuring the security of our partners, where they, you know, constantly invite foreign ambassadors or diplomats to, to, their, uh, to their work, you know, in a way to secure, to, to, to maintain the security. Um, mm. I think we reached a point where we also would like to invite you to contribute.
I don't uh, know the names of you, so uh, I will treat everyone equally. But uh, are there any questions in the room? There is one at the back, and there's a microphone right behind. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Karen, and I'm from Karolinska Institute at the Medical F um, University here in Stockholm. I was wondering about the role of the diaspora. Did that come up in any of the um, reviews in terms of uh, changing norms is in, in a world that's increasingly you know, people are crossing borders? It would be interesting to hear um, if what, what the role of the, the diaspora is mm. in this. Both, I guess, yeah, with regards to anti-discrimination or changing norms and if there's any link to poverty. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question here. Thank you. My name is Karin Norberg. I'm the chairperson of the Center for Economic and Social Rights. So that's why I'm particularly interested in this discussion. Uh, for the time being, our organization is focusing very much on fiscal justice and the SDG 10, income inequality. So I would like to hear from the panel, I mean, both in terms of these two different aspects of development, which is in one way linked to political and civil rights, and in the other hand is linked to economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, how do you see sort of the resources? Someone mentioned resources. Resources play, as far as we have seen, an extremely important role. And it's both sort of an indication of discrimination of, uh, and it could also be used to counter discrimination in terms of resources being distributed, uh, let's say, from above. I mean, the state's uh, efforts to enable individuals to help themselves move out of poverty, uh, which is, uh, as far as I could understand, sort of this above and below perspective which you were talking about, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone, Corin, you'd like to take on some of this? Yeah, I think that question on the diaspora was quite interesting. And uh, again, focusing back to Afghanistan, I think, I mean, at the same time that you see a large number of people leaving Afghanistan, during the last few years, there has also been uh, a conscious effort of the government to try to attract back uh, well-educated, trained people who have fled and then got an education abroad. And, and you can see that in some, in some part of the administration, that, that you have this young cohort of people who have experience in education from abroad. And, and I think that that could be a powerful norm changer ahead. Um, not, not that we have seen significant effects yet, but, but I think that that flow of the diaspora back to the country could actually mean something for, uh, for the development of Afghanistan, also in terms of changing norms and, and being exposed to... Yeah, to the anti-discrimination measures we have here, mm. for instance. Mm. So I think that, that could be an interesting way yeah. ahead. Thank you. Someone would like to take on the Corinne's question. I can, I can have Andrew? a go. Okay, have a yeah. go. I mean, that's a very big issue that you, you have raised. And I'm glad to hear that you are working on it solidly. <laughs> um, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, taxation and public expenditure can have enormous impacts. And, uh, you know, decisions are being made all the time about where to put the emphasis. Um, I'll go back to Rwanda again, because it's, it's a good example. Um, in Rwanda, uh, they spend a lot on health. There's a big success story in health uh, compared to other countries of its income level and its capabilities. Um, so they have a health insurance system which reaches 80% or more of the population. And they have invested hugely in improving the quality of services. So people pay the insurance. Sometimes it's very difficult for them to pay the insurance premium because you know, they're, they're poor. They're, if they're not under the poverty line, they're just above it. And uh, they haven't got many resources. Um, but 
if you look at education, education by comparison is a bit starved of resources by comparison with other countries at similar income levels. And so it's very intriguing to work out why that is. You know, in many countries, it could be the opposite, but it has enormous impacts uh, on the poverty dynamics that I was talking about. So we don't find ill health. You mentioned ill health as a major cause of impoverishment. It's the major cause across the world, I guess, in, certainly in developing countries. Um, we don't find that to the same extent in Rwanda. Our life histories are not full of tragedies which have ill health at the center. Really staggering finding, uh, and it's down to this health insurance system, which is compulsory and so on. And, you know, lots of government effort put into. But on the education side, um, you know, kids are dropping out of school. Uh, there are lots of additional payments that people have to make to keep their kids in school. They have to provide them with food. They have to provide teachers incentives for this and that. There are so many additional payments, and people can't afford to do that. So the kids drop out. So, you know, there's a, there's a very big implication there about the additional resources which the Rwandan government needs to raise. They shouldn't take from health and give to education. They have to raise additional resources from somewhere uh, in order to really bolster the, the education system and get you know, help, because education is hugely helpful in getting people out of poverty and helping them to stay out of poverty. But you've got to get, it's not just enough to go into primary school and then spend two or three years in primary school. You need to get at least one child in a, in a family needs to go through secondary school. And then it will make a big impact, or, or some post-primary education, technical school. Uh, then it will make a big impact on the, the household as a whole. David, you, you wanted to come in? So, uh, thank you for both questions. So, the first, the first question. Uh, you mentioned uh, diaspora and changing norms, anti-discrimination, but then you mentioned poverty right at the end. So, I'll, I'll focus on the last little bit. Uh, I mean... In the global financial, in the, one of the, the, the recent financial crises of 10 years ago, everyone expected, so in the case of Uganda and several developing countries, we expect remittances, in, for example, to dramatically, to, to dramatically fall for many developing countries. That wasn't the case. That didn't happen. And that didn't happen primarily because of the types of employment that, uh, that people who, who leave and go and work in the UK actually, actually undertake. But whether this actually impacts on poverty is a separate, is, is, is a more intricate question. And again, it goes back to the definition of what we're looking at. It, go, it impacts on poverty at, a, at an aggregate level, but it rarely impacts on extreme poverty, at least from our, our findings and our research. But you rarely get an, an extremely poorly defined and vulnerable household sending workers or connected to workers overseas. There can be some filter down from that, that cash that's been sent to extended family members, but of our research in a few countries, that, that can be rather limited if you're looking at extreme poverty. The second question, uh, thank you very much, because you've made a seamless link to the latest NIE policy note that I'm going to give you after this event. <laughs> so fiscal justice, or you mentioned fiscal justice, but income inequality, uh, economic social rights... We're doing a whole, where we're going with uh, gender budgeting with the UN ECA in Addis is, so in the case of my story of, of gender, the Uganda example, we've kind of come to the point where governments such as Uganda have now, are now operating a box ticking exercise to accomplish the, 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 the gender, uh, the, 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 the gender uh, targets. Um, the UN ECA, particularly the Ngoni Diop there, uh, we're working with, with them in terms of fiscal space and how we can move on in terms of gender budgeting for the taxation and the fiscal budgeting side to create gender, gender budgeting, gender space in, within that fiscal for, for, in, for, for, for the tackling of economic and social rights. So, uh, and that's the basis of where we're going with this. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, from fiscal to temporal space, we are uh, quickly moving towards the end of the seminar. But Hans, please. Uh, I would like to comment on, on the question on, on diaspora as well, because we have seen, you know, in a, sometimes in ways that have surprised us how the diaspora here in Sweden can really be a resource uh, and play a really central role in the work to change uh, norms and attitudes. 
We've been working quite a lot here in Sweden with migrant communities, strengthening especially migrant women's sexual reproductive health and rights. We have produced uh, four, 13 mo small movies in 14 different migrant languages for a Swedish audience. But we could tell already after a couple of months that some of these small films have had, you know, hundreds of thousands of viewings. We produced a small film about the myths about the hymen and, and, you know, about the regional corona in Somali that after two months had had uh, 170,000 viewings. And then it was apparent that it was not only Somali women that were looking at our films and, you know... Uh, getting this information, they were sharing it as, as well with their friends and, you know, relatives, you know, around the world, and I guess also in Somalia. So I think it, we can see that the, the diaspora can, you know, play a, a crucial role here. Yeah, um, the time is way too short. This is a very interesting report uh, coming from a Swedish perspective. Uh, there are issues... Uh, related to norm influences, because uh, one of the findings is that it, to be effective, you work through norm influences. What is that? That is religious and traditional leaders, Swedish organizations. We are Swedish. We're way up uh, in the um, corner of the world value surveys with our individualism and uh, secularism. Uh, so it's a challenge for us uh, as Swedes, uh, and we uh, promote issues that are difficult to work with, but it's very uh, important to work with these norm influences. Uh, there are issues around um, the scale, as we discussed, uh, how, what scale would be more effective to work on and, and how to promote the best approaches. Uh, and there are a number of lessons from the work of, of RFSU and other Swedish organizations. So this is a debate to be continued, I, I'd say. Uh, but for now, uh, I'd like to, to, to thank you all for coming and for participating. Uh, I'd like to thank Sida and the chief economist team, Karin at least, represented, for co-organizing with us. Uh, I also would like to extend a warm thank to the panel with a round of applause. <laughs> the uh, report, if you already have given away your, your hard copy to a friend or a colleague, you can download it from uh, www.eba.se. There you could also find a link to uh, the uh, chronic poverty report, which you can download. Uh, you could find a number of other uh, reports there as well, and you can sign on to, to our newsletter and our emails. Uh, the next EBA seminar will be held on the 17th of October, and it will deal with uh, social protection and gender. So most welcome then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.